I'm the curator of the biggest collection of African American literature and life, which uh, lives here at Anderson Library. Yes. Uh, I'm an employee of the University of Minnesota Library. Uh, but better than that, I'm the home director. And uh, with the job, <laughs> um, came here in September to do this. I was just saying to some folks that, uh, some dear ones, that um, they said folks in my neighborhood. I had that. Um, I'm here to invite in uh, generations that know this place uh, to remember um, what is so easily forgotten and, and, and often willfully yeah. about us. Yeah. Including sort of more recent history, because these folks that we have here today ain't too ancient. <laughs> My dear elders. Uh, to talk about cultural community in the Twin Cities. And we have the archive uh, on display, a little exhibit that I curated for you, which I wanted to say a few things about and also establish some house, you know, business. So, first business, if you need to use the restroom. If you need to use a restroom, you leave here and cross the atrium, right? There's also water over there. Um, water. There's food graciously supplied. Thank you all. Uh, but we ask that you keep food on this side of the room because on this side of the room, beginning with the first edition of Phyllis Wheatley's poems on subject of religious and moral, mm -hmm. the Black Madonna, right? Out of which the rest issues on the side of the dead land. Uh, we have a sampling of the archive, and we want to keep food away from it. We have water, yeah. and our hands. I'm I've washed my hands several times, and I'm not shaking hands because of that. If you would like me to flip through a book for you, and I'm guessing you will, and you should, in fact you should, uh, I will be glad to do that, as I'll be able there uh, on the uh, after this. We heard from our guests. Okay, so that's about all I'm going to say. If you would like to know more about the Gibbons Collection, you can be in touch with me directly. You can go on the internet. It's a terrible website. Uh, hopefully, something will be done about that. Uh, and I'll have a conversation about how you might actually use this place. Because typically, this is, you know, we don't just hand things to people. And there's a reading room, there's a whole, if you've done any uh, archival research at uh, an academic library, uh, there's a whole rigor mortis. Well. Uh, which I, 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 I gladly explain to you. Mm -hmm. Without further ado, I'm introducing the group. Oh, Raquel. Okay, okay Raquel, I'm using our guest to introduce our guest. Okay. Raquel, see us something. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, Thanks for being here. That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, I'm Raquel CSR. I'm actually the executive director for In Black Inc. In Blank Inc. is in partnership with More Than a Single Story and the Gibbons Foundation for Af African American Literature. And we've been doing this a few years. I think Carolyn will talk a little more about our programming and how we come together and why we think this is important. But in terms of In Black Inc., um, about six years ago, five, six years ago, we started a nonprofit state. Um, we call it a state initiative. Um, community grassroots program so that we can look at the way in which Black stories, stories from the African-American, the African community is collected. 
we really was concerned about, you know, a lot of the folks in our community transitioning without sharing their stories. A lot of the knowledge and the information from around our communities being lost with the rewriting of history, the not inclusion of certain narratives. And so we really wanted to make sure that we include narratives from our folks so that our children see that we've been present and the work that we've done. And so in Blacking is actually um, built on a few other of our ventures that I'll talk about a little today in our discussion with our guests. But we really felt that it was necessary for us to look at including the stories of people of African descent, not just in publication, but also looking at supplying um, certain support so that we can nurture and build their <laughs> skill sets in the areas of editing, writing, um, laying out, anything that has to do with the publication of a book. So we're not a typical pub publisher, we're a nonprofit publisher, publishing arts org that kind of include a number of educational forums that we um, provide for our community. So with that, I say welcome and thank you guys. It's been a joy being in partnership with this young lady. And now we have Dabu. Dabu went first because he is the mutant. So we pushed him <laughs> out. So that's why he got degrees and it's his home. So we wanted to make sure he welcomed us to the um, new event here. But thank you for being here. Okay, can y'all hear me? Uh -oh. Yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. you can. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I'm Carolyn Holbrook, and I am the director of More Than Sales Story. Um, so, as 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 Ted pointed out, um, these three organizations are working together with embracing our roots, so we're all doing you know our own thing as well. Um, so more than a single story, we're going into our ninth year of positioning the literary arts as a catalyst for cross-cultural healing and social justice. We connect BIPOC writers with broadly inclusive communities through readings, public conversations, and writing workshops that foster insight, empathy, and literary skill building. And we are extremely grateful to the voters of Minnesota for grants from the Metro Regional Arts Council and the Minnesota State Arts Board for supporting Embracing Our Roots. So I'm excited to announce that with funding from the Jerome Foundation, more than a single story will be offering a year long mentoring program for black writers beginning this fall. Mm -hmm. Stay tuned because um, they'll be coming out in the newsletter and other um, social media as well. We also invite you to join us, to join us this Tuesday um, for our next quarterly Writer to Writer series, which will be online and will feature Hawana Sullivan, Jansen and Antonio Duke. Um, that will be online and have a flyer on the table. And then also, beginning in late May through June, our panel series, Our Stories Ourselves, will feature a series of panel conversations on fathers. So songs for our fathers, you know, Horace Silver, songs for our fathers, will include a panel with single fathers, another with married fathers, and a third with grandfathers. And some of the panels will be Dabu Seru, and Clarence White, who is somewhere, I saw him somewhere. Yeah. And, <laughs> and Russ Ballinger and Jonathan Brown and more. So we invite you to visit our website, sign up for our monthly newsletters to stay up to date with our events. So a little bit about embracing our roots. Shortly after the murders of George Floyd and Dante Wright, um, Black Table Arts invited small groups to visit their new space that they had set up in South Minneapolis. And it was lovely to hear their director, Keno Evil, and his team of young arts, arts activists speak with pride about their reverence for elders and the ancestors, and to see quotes by literary ancestors pointed on the walls as we strolled through their beautiful place. But while Keno was talking, it struck me that while these beautiful young people hold those who came before them in the highest regard, they didn't have much awareness of Black artistic history here in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So I invited him to join me in designing a project to educate young arts leaders on the significant milestones in Minnesota mm -hmm. Black arts history. And Raquette and Nura Siasar were there that year too, so I asked them if they would join us in the effort. Thankfully, they did. And uh, rather than, <clears throat> excuse me, rather than just featuring esteemed elders and culture bearers, or having the young artists interview them, we invited intergenerational dialogue so that issues and topics can be discussed from the viewpoints of both generations that are presenting. 
In this way, the series encourages us to think in depth about how we all survive the storms and keep on creating. Sadly, Black Table Arts is no longer with us, but then when I learned that Davu Underwood Saru was becoming the curator of the Gibbons collection, it was a no-brainer for us to invite him to join us, as we pointed out. And um, I'm just really excited that this effort is still being led by three Black organizations because we all have a stake in amplifying our community. So since the programs, in, since embracing our roots inception three years ago, we have featured people like John Wright, Alex Pate, Mary Mark Easter, T. Michael Rambo, our little little, I saw him, and Elena Scope, in conversation with young leaders like Alana Morris Van Tassel, Ada B. C. Wilson, Genesee Williams, Jasmine McBride, Brittany Delaney, may she rest in power. We also offer programs with Asian Americans who, who discuss these issues in their communities. So I'm thrilled today that we have two amazing couples, Saitu Jones and Soyi Gaiden, in conversation with our partners, Anura and Raquette Siosar. Today's event will be the second time that we've presented couples for Embracing the Roots. We were so blessed to be joined by Notando and Lucy Zulu in a beautifully enlightening conversation with their grandson, Joshua Gillespie, shortly before Sister Notando joined the ancestors last year. So before I introduce today's speakers, please uh, just take note of the survey that's in your chair. And at the end of today's program, please pull them out and return them to Mia, who's sitting over there in the corner, and um, or put them on the table where she is. And also, we will have time for questions and answers following the conversation. So now, <laughs> wow, so let's get on with our conversation. I'm so excited. I'm so excited about today's presentation. Um, say to Ken Jones. As most of you here probably know, is a multidisciplinary artist, an advocate, and a maker, and a fourth generation Minnesotan. His 30 year collaboration with his wife, Soyeen, Danielle Fadden, includes co created sculptural installations that inspire and inform the viewer. Together and separately, they channel the spirit of radical social movements into experiences that foster critical conversations and nurture more just and vibrant communities from the soil up and also how and why they connect with the land to connect with known relatives as well as unknown ancestors. Say too has created over 40 public artworks across the nation. And so his poetry and prose have been published in collections for over 25 years. <clears throat> in collaboration with two other artists, they co-founded Frogtown Farm, it's called Frogtown Park and Farm, a 5.5 acre urban farm and six acre park in St. Paul. Frogtown Farm epitomizes the belief that food, green space, nature, and trees should be accessible in all neighborhoods. Anira and Raquette CSR are the co-founders of Inhotep Science Academy and Initiatives, an African-centered KQA educational STEM program that has existed for over 24 years. While in grad school at the U of M, they founded Papyrus Press, one of Minnesota's first Black publishing organizations. Together, they are part of the group that founded In Black Inc. with a mission to develop publishing arts opportunities for African heritage writers. Anura is an educator, a publisher, and a firefighter. And Raquette, Raquette is a recently retired school psychologist who now leads In Black Inc. as its executive director. Their work together has spanned several decades during which they have engaged and consulted with communities and organizations to change the academic and literary landscape for Black children here in Minnesota. Usually, you'll see them with their children. One of them is right over there, <laughs> fulfilling their belief that community work is family work. So there is so much more that I could say about our esteemed couples, but I'm going to get out of the way and turn the conversation over to them so they can speak for themselves. And this will be an unmoderated conversation. And uh, we, like I said, we will have time and we're for a Q&A. So let's welcome our speakers. <laughs> thank you guys, thank you guys. Um, this is like, we're gonna be chatting with each other. So you're just, you know, we're feeling your energy and we're pulling from you as well because it's so important to be sitting up here as part of a couple. And so I think that's part of the nature of why Carolyn and Davu was like, yes, 
we need to do this. And it was their brainchild. But um, Rick had CSR again. And before we start, I just wanted to be able to invite the uh, spirits of our ancestors to be present with us as we have this conversation and as we, as we have you engage with us afterwards. So um, I'm not gonna ask people to call out names right now, but if you can just think of someone that you, whose energy or whose love or whose um, presence in your life that has brought you some joy and some strength and just invite them to be with us today as we start. But I'm gonna open up. Yes. So I want to start with we've had a couple of conversations over the last several months. Um, and part of the conversation, I I said I really wanted to start with our origin because we're like four separate people, but when people see us, they see two a lot of times. It's like, oh, so you can't say two. And there are raquette. It's like I'm not from Minnesota, and so a lot of times I get swiped up into his world, and people just kind of combine us when they talk about us. And so I want to start with our origin story. Like, who are you? Like, what are you about? And I mean, I can start if people would like, but I'd really like to hear. Okay. Well, I'm at. Actually, I was not born in this country, so I'm from Guyana. I came here when I was eight years old um, with a large family, five sisters, well, four sisters, one brother, grandmother, and my parents. Um, my dad worked with the prime minister in Guyana for um, most of my early life that I can remember. And he was just like a disciplinarian. He'd show up like, you know, several times a month because most of the work he did was away from us. And he would line us up in size order and drill us on facts, like, you know, um, history facts, um, cultural facts, just to see like how he related to, you know, your community. And just enough, just so that he knew that once he left us and come back, you know, the story was still with us. Like we were not just stagnant in our world. But um, came here, lived in New York for most of my early life. Um, and then actually, I was an art student, um, middle school and high school. In New York, you know, kids are like really, really um, independent. <laughs> so at 12, I was taking the bus to middle school where I applied without my mom knowing because I didn't want to go to school in my neighborhood. And so there was an hour and 45 minute ride across town, three buses, yeah. um, no no school bus, you know, you get your own bus card and um, would take those buses across. I went did my um, art kind of um, audition took my portfolio and everything, got it, and then I told my mom, you know, this is the school I'm going to. Coming from another country, she, you know, it's like, as long as you're doing what you're supposed to do, my mom was like, okay, here it is. But that was my introduction to the arts because my dad was also an artist, and that was one of the things I really enjoyed doing. So I went to high school at Art and Design, Two years after, went to the Fashion Institute of Technology and then decided that I didn't really like the arts <laughs> in that way because, I mean, especially the fashion, um, it was the pretentiousness for me was just hard. And so, especially in New York, and I was pretty good because I was a designer and illustrator, and then I decided, you know what, I prefer psychology, which I, at 11, had said I wanted to go into anyway. So I went into a four-year uh, program in psychology, and I ended up here because I wanted to do grad school at the U of M. But I would really like you guys to talk a little about, you know, Sure, sure. Uh, you know, for me, actually, you want to start first here. Yeah? So, yeah. <laughs> Good man. Yeah. 
I don't necessarily want to start, but I, I'll, I think it's a mistake. But she's always so, correcting me, so I, <laughs> I have to correct you on that because I am not always correcting you. Welcome to our world. Welcome to our world. This is another damn thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, my creation's origin story. I don't even know where to begin, but I think it was a good segue because um, uh, say to is an author generation, Minnesota, uh, Minnesota, and so, and, and so it's a new So um, I, I think I didn't grow up in Arizona. I grew up in uh, South Dakota. And um, I say that, that, but now I, I kind of enjoy it. And part of my um, just, I didn't see myself as an artist, uh, as a youngster. I did enjoy and love reading, and I love libraries, and I love um, old dusty stores and stuff like that. And I could just live in a library or someplace and just never see people. I, I just love that. So part of my origin story is I I wanted to be able to um when when I remember my first reading a book and the book first book that I really really enjoyed. But I couldn't figure out I think it was in about fifth grade and I couldn't figure out how someone can write something that perfectly. Because in, as a fifth grader I didn't know about editing and all of those things. Um, but I was uh, interested in creating uh, for myself, not so much for a lot larger audience, but I was, and, and, and I'm still to an extent still like that. Um, the other part of my origin story is um, that, that I feel very close to and deep feel very deeply about my my grandparents who migrated to South Dakota from Mississippi and Missouri. And uh, so many of the stories that um, they they told us that only began making um, making sense or be putting those pieces together as I became as I became older and I became more aware of uh, the, the history of the country and the history of uh, of uh, South Dakota, the ancient South Dakota that I grew up. And I think in terms of origin, I feel more deeply um, in, in the past few years, my connection um, to uh, my ancestors um, and my gracefulness um, for them and my understanding um, that uh, of the lives that they, they, they led or didn't, but able to read. One uh, story I have in relationship to that, sometimes I really, I'm hurting myself, I chastise myself, because I'm kind of lazy. I, I know I am. And, and although my sister says, no, you're not lazy, that's just, but I think that um, sometimes it's, uh, it's not difficult for me to, um, as I read a book or, or I, I'm, I'm in my space to watch how the light changes, the light moves across the room. And, and uh, I mean, at work, I, I, because I'm, I, I, I've done work where I have to be responsible getting the work out there. But I'm also, um, uh, you know, my tendency to I, I want to daydream. I want to think about how people's lives were and to imagine. And all about, um, and with the help of my, my mother-in-law, Lucille, I would, um, a great confidant. <laughs> and I would discuss some of those things with uh, her. And, and in, in addition to that, I thought about, I did more research on the lives of uh, 
people, especially the women in my family, uh, their backgrounds, what their lives were like. Some of the things I knew, other things I only discovered later after they uh, transitioned. And too many of them had difficult uh, lives, like many people. Uh, many people have had difficult lives. And so sometimes, even now, you know, when I don't do anything um, work-wise, I mean, traditional work-wise, I think, oh, I call some of the names and I'll say, well, this is for you. I'm just going to speak all the way And sometimes I see them all at the bottom of my bed. You know? But they're chastising me too because I don't write enough. But I also know that sometimes when I'm resting, when I'm daydreaming, or when I'm uh, working in something that's creative, I feel that I have this really deep connection to those, especially those women. And I think I'm I'm grateful for it, and I would love to know. And so, and now I'm going to go take a nap for you because you weren't able to nap when you wanted to. You weren't able to not um, uh, go someplace because you had to be someplace. I don't have to be too many places these days. And I'm grateful for that. And so, I think about. Um, those women especially. And that really is part of my origin story. Not so much that where I'm from or what the other things I've done, but what uh, has made me uh, deepen my understanding of what it is to be a human. Okay, because my elder tells me to. Well, I'm, I'm gonna try to get mine real quick so we can get some juicy stuff. I can't <laughs> no, that's more exciting. But I'm Nora C. Um I am a multi generational person uh, here, St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, you know, you can follow all your ancestors, but uh, probably the most uh, popular line is, is uh, the Parks line. I'm, I'm a part of the family of the the Parks man in St. Paul that came up from uh, Fort Scott, Kansas. Uh, my dad, uh, Richard Parks, um, is the 10th child of uh, Sarah and Andrew Parks from Fort Scott. And with his father, um, my, my grandfather, um, um, and his father, my great-grandfather, um, were porters and would travel around and kind of explore other places, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Even though Minnesota was a uh, very cold, they kind of said, okay, this is definitely better than Fort Scott, you know, um, even though it's cold down there too. Um, but in the 1920s is when we figured that they came up here and kind of brought some of the other clans. And so um, some of the other clans are uh, 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 Gladys Parks family. So if you know any of the uh, uh, Fosters, uh, the Hills, Lillian Parks, if you know any of the Hickmans, uh, Ballingers. So, uh, Robin Russell uh, that you mentioned, um, all we're all part of the different branches, and so uh, so he's number ten. Um, uh, Gladys is um, number thirteen. Lillian's fourteen, and Gordon Parks is fifteen. So Gordon Parks is the baby, um, and he came up here last. Um, it was baby like that. So um, and very protected and nurtured, and and, and all that stuff. Um, but I didn't really know that, though, and, 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 you know, until, you know, my grandma needed to do a report on Gordon Parks. But I don't want to do that. I want to be Dr. J. Um, but um, a lot of that uh, uh, lineage and heritage of the origin stories are actually very important um, because I shouldn't feel like I don't want to do that black guy for report necessarily, I, you know. Um, I was like, who is he? He's not an athlete. He's nobody. And why was that in my mind? Um, I went to St. Anthony Park Elementary School in St. Paul there, right by the uh, uh, State Fair um, in Murray and then St. Paul Central. Um, but um, just real quick before I pass it on is that uh, you mentioned I was an artist. Uh, I'm not an artist. I just hang around a lot of artists. <laughs> they think I'm an artist. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a math science guy, engineering guy. And so... Um, <laughs> And so um, when I'm hanging around these guys, that's a blend in, you know, do what they need to. And so 
Well, that's it. Right there. You know, I, uh, you've heard folks say, uh, I'm a fourth generation Minnesotan. My great grandfather, born in slavery, uh, freed himself, fought in the Civil War, and ended up in Red Wing, Minnesota in the 1870s. Wow. And uh, from there, he uh, earned enough money working as a porter at the St. James Hotel and still standing now to start a farm in Rochester, Minnesota, where my grandmother was born. And she came to the old Rondo neighborhood about 100 years ago. It's amazing to think about that now. So that is kind of this link. Now, I was born not too far from here in the north side, uh, right at the Ridley Maternity Hospital. It was on the corners of Glenwood and Penn building is still there. And uh, my earliest memories are from a set of Quonset huts that were put up to house all the returning World War II uh, veterans. And uh, Quonset huts were on Lindale and, uh, and Olson Highway. And, and housing, sure, there was this housing shortage after World War II, all these returning uh, veterans like my father. Uh, and the site there on Glenwood and, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, on Olson Highway. And, uh, and Lindale was segregated. Uh, you know, all of these uh, Navy veterans, Army veterans are all there in this location. We moved up and out of these Quonset huts into the projects, as we call them, the Sumner Field homes. And so my earliest memories are from that. Then we moved to South Minneapolis. Uh, now, you know, as I look out here, I see there are folks here who have known me for 30 years, 40 years. There are a couple folks that have known me since elementary school for over 60 years. You know, with Sandy Smith and Roxanne, we grew up in South Minneapolis, went to Field Elementary School. And at that time, that African-American community, I mean, you hear it's almost cliche, it's, ah, it's a village, but it really was. Uh, there were these folks that, uh, I mean, you know, Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Gibbons were such endearing souls. Uh, and, never really admonished me. We we're always proud of our little accomplishments when we made them. But that community had these expectations that was that were placed on us. And you know, I couldn't get away from folks either. I mean that was one of the things that irritated me is that like everybody I always felt eyes were on me. <laughs> and uh, while that was irritating growing up. I mean, that was something that helped uh, that helped push me on, and, and to the point where, like Roxanne's father was one of the men in the community that always kind of placed those demands. Uh, I would always have to have a story whenever I ran into Mr. Gibbons and other black men. Uh, they would ask Jones, "What are you gonna do?" And I have to come up quick with, oh, I'm going to go to college and I'm going to do blah, 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 blah. I mean, but those were the kind of expectations and, and pressures that were placed upon us to help guide us through this. And, and I also told Roxanne and Sandy that, you know, with them here, I, I couldn't lie. Uh, so, I have to, so I have to tell the truth here now, uh, with this. But... Um, you know, so that is kind of where I, I came from. It came to maturity uh, during the Black Arts Movement. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, we can talk a little bit more about that. You know, but one of the things I need to acknowledge, too, I mean, while we're up here uh, and, and have produced much and added to the cultural legacy of the Twin Cities of Minnesota, of the country, really. There, there are other couples here, yeah, too, that could be and should be up here. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, John and Serena, Roger and Deanna, you know, it's amazing, too. And when you think about 
these names together. I mean, I heard Celine and I, I mean, I heard Carolyn say our names and last names. A lot of times, just say those first names, <laughs> you know, Kinsey and Nancy, you know, Larry and Corinne. I mean, all these are folks who are here who have been a part of our larger circle and add to this, this community in some way or another. I mean, and then these are all the, a lot of the older folks, you know, but then there are these younger folks who are here too. You know, Janthony uh, is here as well. I mean, so I'm, I'm trying to give big shout outs to a lot of the folks who are here. So I'm, that's all I've done. You know, I'm going to tell a little story. <laughs> so he and I, yeah. <laughs> you know, so he and I were asked to give a keynote talk at the at Harvard Graduate School of Design uh, a couple of years ago. And that's the first time we were asked to do something formally. This is much more informal, so it was a different kind of pressure. Mm -hmm. And we, you see already, we have different styles. <laughs> and so she had everything down. Uh, and I, I didn't necessarily have to have that. <laughs> so, throughout that whole process, fought and fought <laughs> and, uh, and eventually she started writing a script for me <laughs> and and she was the first one to go off script of <laughs> but the uh, the point was we said we would never do that again <laughs> and there we are again <laughs> Oh, this is beautiful. That's part of the public process. Um, uh, I, we do the same thing. I think he's the, and I'm just like, hello. <laughs> 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 yeah. I mean, every couple has their challenges or, you know, styles. But um, it's so wonderful to hear um, the piece. I love that. Say, you know, stop and pause and sleep and rest, you know, for the people that couldn't. I'm good. I'm actually going to adopt that. <laughs> I need some reason why I need to rest all day. <laughs> but I love that. I love that. And he is an artist. When I met him, he had, one of the things I love is that he always doodled, like everything. You look at his papers, they'd be these doodle things all over it. And it's not just like, you know, like little random. It would be Quick really, plants. <laughs> whatever the reason was. It was really, <laughs> it was really intense doodling. And a lot of them, I always said that, you know, it was connected to almost like this third eye vision where, he was seeing something and he was putting it down and only he could see it. And, and it, I was fascinated by it because being told me was, um, I did consider myself an artist, but I wasn't like, you know, I didn't feel like I was in the arts world um, all the time. But I think all of us, I love these stories, these, these um, places we go. But I would ask, in terms of after kind of like that ground and that happened in our earlier years, I know at some point we kind of moved into our focus area of focus or the area that we wanted to kind of go into. When did you feel like, okay, yes, art was the place I wanted to be? You know, like not even just sculpting, but drawing and, you know, um, sculpting and carving and um, putting things together, building, destroying, um, or writing. When when did you feel that was a part? Because and then I'll, I'll preface it with a little bit of, I think both of us kind of connect um, with the sciences. I feel like I'm a social sci science by title, but 
I'm a scientist because I love to watch the, I love to watch creation. I love to watch how things kind of manifest and move and how they come together. And so that's for everybody. When did you decide on those areas that you walked into and where people kind of know you for now? I'll go first because my answer will be short. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <laughs> just in that sometimes it's it's still I, I still don't necessarily say I'm a writer or I'm an artist. It's that I just don't. You know, I, I just don't. And um sometimes when um I've been asked, well, what's your discipline? How what's your practice? Well, I'm undisciplined, you know. I have, um, I, I feel kind of undisciplined, but lately I've been understanding that I do have, especially Lori, my friend Lori Carl has helped me understand. And she said, so you stop saying that you're undisciplined, you're, you, know, you have discipline, you have practices, just maybe it's your, it's, it's my practice. So um, that's my answer. I don't necessarily say I'm, I'm you know, I always wanted to be an artist. Uh, from elementary school, I was copying comic books. Uh, that was my anatomy class <laughs> to, to the extreme if we think about comics. But that was really where I, I began. I never really deviated. From that much. I mean, I may have told folks like Mr. Gibbons that I might be a, 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 an economist or a business person. <laughs> yeah, but I always wanted to be an artist and uh, and exploring, you know, all these different areas. I had an auntie, my aunt Beverly, uh, who in old Rondo. I used to call me Little George Washington Carver, and I used to just rankle at that. I mean, I would never tell her that, but uh, even as a, a, even at seven, eight, nine, ten years old, I, I knew who George Washington Carver was. I mean, such an icon. But what she knew, and I didn't know, a lot of folks don't know, is that George Washington Carver was a painter, was a visual artist. Uh, and that's really what kind of led to the study of botany because his subject was in painting his plants. Um, and she knew my interest in nature as well. And, and so that was one of these things that now I come back to uh, and think about I know. You know, I mean, I did say, when I said, yeah, what, what would rankle me about that? When she called me Little George Washington Carver, I would think, why would I want to be like that old ball headed man? And here I am, that old ball headed man. Exactly. That's why I chuckled when you said that because I, you had, I'm sorry, you had mentioned that to us. Oh, <laughs> but um, well, I I actually wanted to be a psychologist when I was 11 because, and it's a little bit of a, a, a downer in terms of the story. My father had um kind of a nervous breakdown. And so at that time, I remember just really struggling with our family dynamics. And I remember because I was starting to take the bus and going off on my own, you know, to go to my middle school and everything, I would look at um, primarily Black men, like on the bus or on the train. And it was just always this glazed over look in their eyes. And I always felt like, what the heck is going on? I mean, as a young girl, I remember just really being afraid of Black men, mm -hmm. but at the same time, just wanting to figure out how do I help or what's going on because I love my dad, but I also knew that he struggled a lot with everything he struggled with. 
to the point where he couldn't be a part of my family. I mean, he ended up going back to Guyana and the rest of us stayed here. But I had said at 11 years old, I'll be a, I wanted to be a psychologist, but because I needed to use art as a way to get out of my community, um, I went on that artist uh, track. And I remember in high school, I told my advice, well, my main um, focus up until like maybe 11th grade was costume and fashion design. And my um, advisor broke her hip the last year before. And then you needed to have an advisor that would help you with your portfolio to get into the next stage. And so I switched my major to fashion illustration instead, and then did the general illustration. And I remember my um, illustration teacher telling me that you have to apply to art schools because I wasn't applying to any at that point in time. And I decided that, you know what, okay, I'll apply to something and maybe do a couple of years and then be able to use whatever the funds is that I get, you know, from that process to um, go on to get my bachelor's in um, psychology. And that was primarily because my family was very poor. <laughs> and the other part was that in terms of being early poor, I think I remember something that my dad used to say in terms of you can't pay to be indoctrinated. And so part of my whole process of trying to find a field or something that can help pay for my uh, education was that was a part of it. So. That's how I kind of ended up when I ended up. Yeah, well, the, looking at you, all, I always, I try and always compliment you. The way that you look, I complimented your your clothing today and a couple nights ago as well, too. I mean, you can see that. It's all, all a part of that. Uh, you know, one thing that you all need to understand is the Science Academy that they created is this grand and important institution. So Amy and I have this big extended family and have about a million nieces. And about half of them have gone to the Science Academy. Uh, and we were just saying yesterday, it's now two generations or three generations you've been doing for song. Well, yeah. two at least, yeah. You should talk and tell, share what you all do there, really. It's so impressive. I mean, and, you know, just like George Washington Carver, you do mix art and science. That's right. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> no, but... I kind of think of it as um, coming into consciousness for myself. Like I said, I always dread. See, I came in with computers, came in with the, you know, the software, the apples, the first, you know, the floppy disk. You know, I remember the floppy disk? We used to copy games and go play and go to, you know, Radio Shack and all these other armor and, you know, train games and everything on binder sports. So, I was part of Star Wars, Star Trek. So you had to go on the side. You know, it, it, that's kind of the nerd thing back then in the 70s, right? And so um, um, just fast forward just a little bit. Um, ultimately, it didn't matter. Well, back to more. Okay. So I went to Central. There's this great lady that named Kate McGuire. Um, I knew I was going to be an engineer. All right. Um, and she made sure that I was going to be an engineer. She made sure all the black students were. Um, she made sure they got internships like at 3M. It was a 3M step program, which a lot of people went to. I could never get in that program, though. I never knew why. Um, but here's what she did she made sure that uh, I went on a field trip to Honeywell and she connected me with some people that uh, made sure that I had a full ride at the University of Minnesota in electrical engineering. Um, she always, you know, would recognize black students for the different academic years. Um, and you know, whether it was math, English, or whatever, and uh, at least have each year I was on there for something for math or you know, science or some physics or something like that. So she she would always kind of do that. Um, my senior year, um, there was a it was a part of a program called the Central Minority Education Program, 
My senior year, they were closing it down. I didn't know what that meant. I was an A student. Not my first year I was an A student, but after, after, after that SRA test, that little BASO said my reading level in ninth grade was at a sixth grade level. And I figured those teachers were lying to me. And so I said, man, I got to take my education in my own hands because everybody's giving me these grades that is not reflective of this standardized test. And so um, besides my ninth grade year, um, A student. Um, and I thought I was just really smart. And I um, asked Ms. McGuan, you know, what's the big deal about that program? And I, uh, she said, well, you know, that full ride you got, that one happened this, I took you on that field trip, you know. Um, all these other ones who have this uh, 3M STEP program or have this support, that support, it wouldn't happen unless we did that. And I wouldn't be here unless the community right around Central didn't put that program there and put her there. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the first time, I felt really stupid and dumb and unhumble and everything like that because that's true. Um, we wouldn't have no Black History Month program, you know, because they didn't teach no history in my classes or anything like that. And so I made a commitment that senior year to save that program. And so um, this was kind of my awakening. I had the seeds. Um, um, my dad, Metric Giles, he's back there, my uncle, Melvin Giles, used to do these different sculptures. Now, he's an artist. He used to do these African sculptures of red, black, and green. He used to do these um, different kind of mobiles with different geometric shapes that kind of reminded you of Africa and stuff like that. Those seeds and my grandmother, and my grandmother is Mary Lee Lynn Parks. She used to be part of the Eastern Stars, the uh, Missionary Society of St. James, the uh, Elks. All these things that she used to have us pick bags for, and you know, she's always in the community doing some stuff, always with those things. Those seeds uh, culminated to me saying, Okay, I have a community. Before I was black by default, now I'm conscious as a black person. <laughs> and she said, Well, you want to solve this, you want to save this program, which means my job, you know, that's what she interpreted as her job being there. She said, Well, you need to go talk to two people. She said, One was Mahmoud Okati. And then she said, Patty Hickman, Patricia Hickman. My boot had the knowledge and the history and things like that. But Patty Hickman, uh, she married to Bobby Hickman, you know, the Hickman family there. She was the fire. She was the one that would go into, you know, people's face and tell you, this is what you need to do. She had me go to the school board and took me down there to speak about the program to say why it worked and why it was beneficial and all that stuff. My first public speaking thing. So that consciousness is what how I became. So after that point, I didn't even care if I was an engineer or whatever. I, I didn't see myself, I just see myself as helping the community and getting our freedom at that point. Um, that's what happened there. And so um, that's when I knew that, you know, the sense we born to was African consciousness. So, yeah, but um, kind of like Dr. Wright here, I started off with electrical engineering, but this was too much and I had to switch over to American studies and, uh, Kind of get some other stuff going in terms of teaching education, which is kind of good stuff. But, sorry. Oh no, that's all right. Because you asked about the. I'm sorry. sorry. You asked about the uh, science academy. Yeah. Um, oh, too, <laughs> so I was gonna move on. Like, I, I, I hear you saying that. No, I'm just saying we should probably. Well, here's a quick question. You know, quick story. Quick story. We went to um, Egypt this past year, last year, last summer, and um, you know we divided up our money, and I gave him some money, and I kept some money, and our daughter had some money. At the end of the time, we had to take all his money back. Because he was out there just buying like five of He was just giving them, and, and it was okay because you know you want to support the people that you feel are deep. But they were like selling him stuff and then keeping the stuff. I mean, to the point where it was like you can't carry nobody anymore. So yeah, that's how I feel. Let's take it back. But um, us, the science academy. Well, you know what. We met in college and in um, graduate school, I came here from graduate school. We decided that we wanted to kind of do curriculum. He was, he went into education after um, 
after engineering and decided that he wanted to teach. And I'm not going to speak for everybody else. I'll, I'll let you talk. <laughs> but um, part of what we decided to do with the Infotech Science Academy was as a teacher, I used to go to whatever school he was at and we would have these science fairs for students at the school. And then it kind of took flight. So he started at um, Harvest Prep, um, Seed Academy when they were not, you know, a charter, when they were a private school, and then it kind of branched off from there. But the Imhotep Science Academy became an institution in the community where we started really seeing that our children were not really staying with science. They love science in the beginning, but then they would not stay with it. And so we wanted to really encourage them. And so we made it a Saturday program for K-8, and it's been going ever since. But we can talk a little more so. We used it to create consciousness. So what is science? Is science, it was science, it's science that's uh, embedded in our history and culture and heritage. And so they knew they know about Dr. George Washington Carver, but they also know the intellectual heritage of African people, not only here but also on the continent. And so they're able to see science not as a, simply as an academic subject either. They can see science as a way to solve problems. Yeah. And so they learn the scientific method of um, these people necessarily call it the scientific method. So they do that whole process and they will do projects with postal boards. And we travel around the country going to national science fairs with their projects. Mm -hmm. And so that um that's so we're creating uh, responsible citizens for the black community um, that, that are not only grounded, but also can think critically and, and, and build some of that service, you know, in a productive way. So. Well, say to an island, when I was 17. Was <laughs> <laughs> so we, we did meet at uh, it was a it was it was the Twin Cities. It was a group of uh, artists. Um, it was in, in all of this events, and we eventually called ourselves the Twin Cities Black Community Coaches. So um, I I guess I have always been interested in art and communications. And, you know, adjacent to everything else. <laughs> Um, so how do we want to talk? Because we wanted some weird conversations um, this week about how we wanted to talk about being artists, couples, and I say to what used to say a couple of what, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, how do we want to talk about that? Well, I would like to talk a little about the work that you do collectively. Oh, oh. it might have been. Well, it's, we have one. Yeah, this one's right. But yeah, I, I would like if you guys can talk a little about um, some of the collaborative work that you've done. I know that um, individually you've done a really beautiful job at just not just poetry, but also recording certain things. I know we've had some conversation about some of the folks that you've had the opportunity to meet and talk and write um, pieces that our community should know about. Um, since, I don't even know if it was back in the 70s, <laughs> um, but I'd like to hear how that came about. And then we've also had the opportunity to see some of the work that you've done together, like with the Shadow Project and some of the other projects, because there's tons of, uh, if you go around anywhere in the, state of Minnesota, I think, you will see public artwork by St. Two, and then you would see the writings on there that are so unique. And I think a lot of times people don't always know that it is a collective piece, and they should, but it's all over the state of Minnesota. It's actually on this campus here. I know you have some pieces in, is it the Pillsbury House? It's Pillsbury Hall. Hall, yeah. The English Battalion. Yeah, but go ahead. I want to hear a little about that. Uh, you know, so he started to tell you our creation story, uh, <laughs> but it began, and she didn't give a year. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, she took the microphone right when I was getting ready to reveal the, the year. Okay. Yeah, because it sounds like you might have to answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our yeah, yeah. The, uh, and actually, that's another little side. We have been collaborating and sometimes collaborating with each other <laughs> as we create work together. But we met uh, at the height or the kind of, or the middle or kind of the waning of the uh, black arts movement, which was this, the, the artistic and creative arm of the black power movement and the civil rights struggle. Uh, we met at a gathering, as we said, of, of artists, and that was in 1974. Um, or seven, no, 74. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I remember. My memory isn't good on a lot of points, but it, I, that, and I remember that year because that was also the first year I went to to Africa. It was all in 1974, and uh, and at that point in my life, I was not the. Uh, I was not necessarily a good man, or what folks would think would be a good man. Well, let's not talk about Yeah, that. anyway. <laughs> so it took me 10 years of begging before she actually <laughs> would go out with me. <laughs> so, and, but saying all that to say is that from that time, uh, in that collective, that Black Arts Collective, we worked together. Uh, I did graphics, she would do the text and, and critique the work uh, as we went on. And when we, then after we married, we kind of continued that, right? even becoming a little closer with the work uh, that, that we've done and, and, and still do together. You know, so Yini, and I always remind her of this, is not necessarily published on paper, but her work is published in the streetscape. Uh, it is throughout the, the Twin Cities. We can see her work, her poems that are etched into concrete, clay, and steel. Uh, and I have always loved to work with text. And so we work with shape and with text together. Uh, and it has been it has been rewarding uh you know over this time to have this thing that we do together but to also be able to stand back and look at this thing to add these things to the streetscape uh and to think about these things in the same vein uh, that we started out with in 1974 and that was to really change the world and we're still working towards that. Well, the thing about it, it comes it's a rebuttal. Now. It's, it's not a rebuttal. It, yeah, it's um, it's with when you know working um together, you know, as a couple. It it's the um. What makes it possible? And what we have to continue, we always have to work on is the truth and the honesty and communication and commitment. And otherwise, it simply doesn't work. It is hard as it is. But if you don't have those elements, it's, it's absolutely impossible. Um, say, too, is sometimes. Uh, a romantic, but I'm not romantic. <laughs> oh, we're killing him. No, it's, it's, it's not, but I, I'm just talking about what you see the, the work, you see the, 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 the completion of the work, but as far, as far as being. Like a couple, this, this couple, we work together, and we wouldn't have been able to do that without having the trust. Mm -hmm. You know, 
the honesty, which is sometimes really difficult but necessary. Uh, the commitment and then the communication. And I'm sure that we have the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I think um, we've been together what like 29 years, 30? I don't even know. <laughs> 1992. So um, and I think we do everything together in terms of work. Um, and not everything like work connected at the hips or anything, but um. When he's he 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 actually did the teaching in Hotel Science Academy. I would do the operations. I would do the organizing. I would make sure everything flowed, everything run. In Papyrus Publishing, he might do the editing piece. I did the uh, again the operations. I did the outreach. I did the you know structuring things, making sure everything was right, making sure everybody had what they need in Black Ink, even though he. Had, he said he's the least or the most underpaid volunteer <laughs> ever because he volunteers for everything in terms of helping and support because we want each other to succeed, but more than that, we want each other to not work ourselves to death. I think that's the thing. And we're kind of passionate about the work we do. And so when I start something and if he sees me kind of flail a little, We'll kind of jump in and try to figure out, okay, what do you mean? And that's that becomes the work together. But um, so from grad school to now, I mean, um, really, yeah. I mean, I know we're able to debrief at the end of the day, but then there's there's definitely sometimes, and I'm like, don't help me. <laughs> or at least you're debriefing. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they say to me, we're fighting, that's okay. We are fighting. That's okay. How can you create something and not have tension uh, and disagreement? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is that something looking at the audience here, looking at all these other artistic couples that are here? You know, the thing that drives us all as artists, and you just kind of hit on that, is this passion, you know, and that comes from this deep well of love uh, that we have for the work, for the world, for each other, uh, that drives us, you know, so that is the, at the core of it is that deep passion that's there. <laughs> The passion is true and real, and so is the love. Uh, however, I found in the time that we've been living and working together is sometimes there's we there's something deeper than, than the love. The love is critical, mm -hmm. um, but the love can't hold it up all by itself. Right, right. Like there's a vision there. There's, there's that you have a vision of what you want to do. Like I said, when I came to consciousness, there's a vision of community. She didn't have that. There's no way we would have fit. Right. That, that wasn't there. There was no chance in, in, in what happened. And so that, that vision, I'm just thinking of, of, like you said, some of the couples and kind of the work they do, even though it's different, it's still within the same scope of that. Vision for not just ourselves and family, but it's our community too. I'm thinking about Victoria, you know, Nick and Vicky Davis, uh, Arthur, you know, Caitlin Watts, you know, these uh, uh, McClumpy and Mary McDonald's, you know, it's just, you know, these long time people that, you know, in themselves, they were spectacular and fabulous. But together, it's just like, man, this is just a whole new kind of creation that, you know, that's just making this community just move just another step forward, you know. Um, and so I think you're right. Um, and, and I gotta be honest, I, I didn't know you were married or have you know until I met you guys at the Fall Conference. That's what I, I did not know. Oh, that. Okay, yeah, I, I, you know, and I'm like, but you know, they say behind that, man, it's another great 
woman is side by side with you, not behind you, side by side. You think you see you know this with your hide. I don't say behind, I say side by side. You can say no. You got to develop those skills. <laughs> I understand um, the concept of being a pillar of the community, but I don't want to be a pillar of the It's a like, you know, something on your back, something on your shoulders, something in your head. I, I want to be for. I, I want to be a community builder, but I don't, I don't really want to be. Well, you know, one of the things that we talk about a lot is this what's ahead for us. And we don't describe it as the last thing or the next thing, but kind of the next season of our lives and what that's going to be. I mean, at the same time, what you're describing is this weariness from holding up or being that kind of pillar. And, and more and more, we talk and plot and plan about these things that, and give more time to these things that we enjoy doing. This past winter, we were gonna, you know, for the last 40 years we've been together, we've been saying that we're not going to spend another winter here in Minnesota. So finally, we were able to get away for six weeks this winter, and, and there wasn't a winter. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's no winter, but, but we're taking more time for ourselves. And, and, and that's a gift that we also want to give to to you all, to, to the world. I mean, we all need time for rest and reflection. And that is also very revolutionary yeah. to be able to say that. And I think, um, I know we are at time, believe it or not, but we so, I know you don't want to be a pillar and I know you don't want to be like admired, but we so admire you and we so appreciate the steps the shadows you've created we're, we're really trying to make sure that those younger people in our community also you know see themselves filling some of those shadows or creating their own because, yeah because we need that we need to see you know the dr rice and the serena and we need to see you know all these young people that are just walking together that's it, it is tough staying together and being together but it's also necessary because my little right that i had last night i don't remember what it was but i'll be mad because i know i was mad at you last night you know, we got to get over that so you know that helps us so and so here's what i say i don't want to be i know that um it's it's important and uh i've been saying i don't want to be for honey so you know still are um so but thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think this conversation is just getting started. Unfortunately though, <laughs> I could listen to this for hours. But so uh, we do have time for questions. Dabu has the mic. I Looks do. like Serena got the first one. I do. I, 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 I can't even help myself yeah. contain oh, myself. Yeah, Serena's yeah. got to so, ask a hard question. No, because one of the questions okay. was how did you, how did you all meet each other? But she was answering the question. Yeah. And how did you all meet each other? But you answered the question. But I want to just say to the audience, and at some point when this recording will be online, mm -hmm. From the bottom of my heart, I am profoundly, deeply in love with you individuals, individuals and a couple. There's a quick story that I will say is there's the magic 
and the respect that you have. That's one word you left out here, but the respect that you have for each other mm -hmm. to, to be able to be, right? Your, your, your being, it, it is nothing holding you back, but yourself that holds you back, right? But in a, in, when I'm talking about magic, in the middle of Trader Joe's, the three of us are having a conversation and the people who are shopping stop shopping <laughs> because they felt the magic, they felt this love, they were laughing at things they didn't even know what they were laughing at. But it is this, this, this magic that you all carry with each other, this respect and this love. And thank you, thank you, thank you for being your individual selves and this amazing couple. <laughs> Other questions or comments? No hard questions, London. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, uh, what advice do y'all have for young artists? I was the thing that I would say is uh, to follow, not necessarily follow the path that I did. But to not give up, to be persistent, to do it over and over and over again. I mean, you've got these folks that are around you that show you love and give you that respect and will give you that encouragement and will also, as I was saying before, place those expectations on you. Now that you've said that, you've got this whole room in here that's going to come back to you and ask you how you're doing. <laughs> how are you doing, Lester? So be persistent. Um, I think in a way you've answered your own questions because you, you, you ask a question, you, you ask for advice. Mm -hmm. You ask for advice. So I, I think that's a, that's a good thing. And my, one part of my advice is to read, uh, to read, that's to right. read, to read, and every day across the board. <laughs> say don't don't sell yourself short i think a lot of uh young artists starting out um compare themselves to others and don't see the uh magic that's contained in their own expression and so if you um show up and and you know be confident that what you're doing is what you are supposed to be doing you might elevate it and change you know, or shift um, lanes down the road, but don't sell yourself short. What kind of artist are you? Poetry, so you like to write and stuff like that? Yeah, you got a few publishers in here, you got the law right here. You do. You got Elder Extraordinaire up here with writing, and like, hey, go back. Hey. You, you got everybody up in here. Raise your hand to do some of writing up in here. There's a bunch of poets See that? Here. Yeah, poets and everything. So before you go, most people are just hand it in, put the hand up, get that kind of information, and then you can connect to their website and stuff like that. All right? You're connected. You're going to be an awesome poet because you probably already are. Okay. Um, one question, so while we're waiting for someone else to raise their hand. Oh, oh, go ahead. Um, as a young lady navigating love myself, my question is maybe can we have one secret from each couple? <laughs> that <laughs> <laughs> How do you navigate a long lasting and healthy relationship? Ooh, that's my granddaughter asking that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was a hard question. <laughs> um, I think the I think we get caught up on a lot of little things. For me, I felt like our values really matched. 
And so there might be some things that I might get mad about, but a lot of times what I have to do is look at, in terms of our being together, our coming together, what do we have similar, you know, um, aspirations in terms of happiness, um, like you said, the respect, the peace around, just really want to lift this person up and feel lifted up as well. But I think that's that's been the key. We we really come together and we're very close in terms of our values and our um not our direct outlook on life because he's very different in some ways. Like the kids know which one to talk to. <laughs> so but um it's, I, I am not because I don't live by my phone. <laughs> so you're saying you're in love right now? You're navigating? So are you with somebody? Oh, you're not. Oh, what? Okay. So I'm trying to find the answer myself. <laughs> but, but. I'm telling you that vision of, of what you see yourself doing and being in the future, um, don't change that. Don't have something similar or almost exactly like it. And you both will go there almost in the sense that you both have it. You'll go there no matter what, whether you're together or apart. We just kept on running into each other because we like the same thing. <laughs> so, it's not true. <laughs> because, you know, we met on campus. You know, are you in school? Oh, y'all you graduated? Man, that was a perfect time. Good, congratulations. But that's what you spoke to. You know, and that would be a good place to find somebody. But, um, <laughs> but the, the thing is, is that, um, when someone has the same vision, you'll end up in the same spaces. So the Africana Student Culture Center was huge at the University of Minnesota. Yeah. We used to bring in all kinds of speakers from around the country. Uh, we used to do all kinds of programs, protests, all this kind of stuff. Um, and um, fortunately, um, the uh, Black Studies Department had staff that was actually involved with us. You know, they actually helped us and mentored us and stuff like that. So now we're in the class and they're in our programs and they also introduced us to the community. And so we're in change in the community. And we just talk about that person you see in all your spaces, not all the spaces, but in most of your spaces, that person probably has a lot in common with you and you should probably get to know them more and connect with them. This is a test. She's looking at me right now. <laughs> she already asked me, what are you going to say? <laughs> I was going to be flipped, but I'm not. I mean, on the same note that uh, Anura said, you know, we met and knew each other for 10 years. Uh, not to say that you need to follow that at all, but we did really get to know each other. We worked together. We respected each other. Uh, and it, it, yeah, and it just, it happened. Uh, you can't really know when it's going to happen. No, but, yeah. <laughs> See, I started to stumble once you started getting closer. So, <laughs> you know, it's just uh, relationships like people in the Bible. And that's a good thing. So, you know, and, we're and we're still evolving. Still trying to figure it out. Yeah. And so. Like, um, say to wakes up in the morning and he says, I'm not obeying paradox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, I say yes all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of help. 
Um, so I have a question from, from another end of that spectrum. Um, so I'm, I'm one of the couples in the room who has been with my partner for 40 years uh, this year. Married to 30 years. And we're not only life partners, uh, we're also business partners. Mm -hmm. So my question for you all is what I've found over the years is that when business is good and when things are juicy, the relationship is great, <laughs> we're looking at each other like, yes, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> but when things are not so good, when things are hard, when the work is hard, when 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 things are a struggle, we're looking at each other and we're reminding each other of what's hard about the work. Yeah. And that, that goes up and down over time. So what are y'all's couple of tips for when things are not so good, when things are hard, when you're looking at your partner and they're reminding you of everything that's hard about the work? <laughs> yeah, I I'll let you answer that one. <laughs> no. The, it, Does that happen for y'all? Yes. Yeah. Yes, and even after the time we've been together, all the time we've known each other, we do have those ups and downs. You know, fortunately, um, the natural state has been pretty steady. But now, the thing that we're, we're looking at is, as I said before, this next season. You know, how are we going to age more uh, or age together uh, on this? And so we have these back and forths on that now. I mean, now, it, and, and while, you know, our income is low, uh, our assets are not at a point where we could take that and do another talk. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you, Deanna, for, for an answer to your question. When, you know, like when things are good and it's juicy, yeah, it's, that's easy. And then the, um, the more difficult time, I think you just have to remember, you have to remind yourself, you just have to remind yourself that uh, it's a difficult time, you've been through difficult times. Opportunities. And if you want to, if that's your desire, then you'll make it through this one. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not easy. And I remember um, one of my nieces would say, Well, how did you and Uncle Say to? Or first, these are the same nieces that would say, Uncle Say to deserves the Survivor's Award. Yeah. <laughs> But then they, some people ask, well, how, how does, how, <laughs> how, how do um, uh, relationships, and on the, when I'm on the flip funny side, I said to her, you just don't get the most. And then, but, because sometimes that can be, that can be, that's a reality. So, but I don't think there's an answer. You know, there, there's no answer to that because it it it, it, it different people, different times. I mean, the relationship has evolved. Uh, whether or not you still love the amount you still of love and respect that's still there. If there's a good deal, and you know, you'll make it. If there's not, then you probably Excellent. So that's my take on it. And you could say something. No, I, 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 now, one of the things that we're doing now when I talk about the next season is we're literally doing estate planning uh, and plotting and planning on our stuff, even. You know, what will happen to our stuff. And he's trying to give directions to that. And it's back to what you were saying at the beginning of this conversation. You know, we've lost so many folks, so many artists, uh, so many community builders, uh, and their history and their legacies are being erased. And how can we ensure that, I mean, part of this ego, I want people to remember me 
and my wife and our work together. But at the same time, I want this to be a template for other folks to be able to use, in particular for artists, uh, to really think and talk about you know, this, what happens after we pass on. And to consciously and with intention um, begin to figure that out. Got one more question. Question here. We're listening in. So we, we can yeah. <laughs> uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you all for the uh, Really appreciate just being able to be in presence and, and listen. Um, I think my question is maybe kind of connected um, for a little bit of context. I've noticed sometimes, I don't necessarily call myself an artist, but art that I have made has come out of a, a hard space. Um, I feel like I've made things that I like when I'm not always liked, maybe myself or my surroundings. Um, so my question both as artists individually, but also as couples coupling, how do you navigate or what is your relationship to specifically like anger? Mm -hmm. um, not even necessarily at or directed at each other, but just sometimes when, when things in the world are not the way that you might want them, how do you navigate them? I think that's a uh, <laughs> um, I think. Oh, okay. Here we go. Sorry about that. So, uh, to answer your question and to touch on your stand, um. There are some little things. I think I'm really pale and I don't, um, I don't, I don't, I don't, not that I don't do anger, but I don't, I try to fix things. I'm more of a fixer. So if there's something happening like in our relationship or in the household, my thing, my initial response is, okay, what do we need to do? Because then I can cry later, I can, you know, scream later or whatever, but the first thing is to fix whatever is, you know, we're kind of struggling with. And I know that his approach is not always the same as mine. And so I kind of give him space to do however you need to do it. But when I do have like a line, yeah, I do have a line where, you know, at some point I'm like, you know what? I don't think it's necessary for you to kind of be, you know, up here. Or I'm not, I don't feel like it's necessary for me to be up here. So I figure out what that line is. And that line being, will I cause more, more damage to our relationship than, um, or hurt to the other person? If I say these things, and sometimes, you know, I might go and do the angry writing or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, I have to do that to kind of get it out. But I'm not, I'm not a, um, I don't believe in kind of putting it on the other person unless I feel like, okay, now you've crossed the line or there's, you know, we need to. And I know earlier on in our marriage, one of the things we talked about in this corner and everything you probably heard it before in terms of really trying to work out and sort out difficulties before you kind of go to bed. And so we used to try to do that. Um, consciously, and I think as we move longer in our relationship, unconsciously, we try to do that, but sometimes the words don't come out, and I find that even if you can't exchange words, sometimes just a touch, like, because that whole piece about not talking to you for a day, or two days, or a week, um, if I put my hand on his hand, sometimes it, it you know, helps drain that anger or that 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 thing that's building up in me so I can kind of let it go. And I might not let go of what I'm mad at, but I can at least talk about it. And so that's that's my practice. <laughs> <laughs> well I think we're gonna wrap it up. Um and thank you all again for coming and thank you.
Yeah. Um, mentioned the video. Um, there will be a video on more of the single stories website. And um, in black ink, you guys, will you be putting video on the website as well? Yes. Okay. And then please remember to fill out the survey that's in your chairs so that we can know how to keep this thing going. And Dr. Uh, has a few last comments as well. The last word. Thank you again for coming to Anderson Library, finding this place. Uh, it can be confusing. We understand. <laughs> Some of us are doing it. Um, there's stuff over here. But the doors to keep this place secure lock automatically in 10 minutes. Wow. And so you're welcome to hang for a little bit. But know that you won't be able to get back in. So, uh, and, and then we also are going to be have to be a little pushy. Okay. So, but again, thank you so much for coming. Anybody got any questions about what you find over here? I'll be here. Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah. Um,